Hey, and welcome to my first ever podcast. My name is Judith Hadali, and I will be sharing my adventures with, liter- with literature in hopes that you will feel inspired enough to pick up a book and read. So, not being heard, or the idea of like, or the thought of not being heard is bad. Not being listened to, now that, my friends, is even worse. It's like people are saying, hey, we hear you, but we couldn't be bothered to listen to you. I guess that makes people feel like they're alone. Um, it makes them feel like what they have to say means nothing. I feel like that a lot, and I, I felt like that a lot, and I still do feel like that. Um, it can really put you in this position where you don't feel like your opinions or thoughts matter. And honestly, it sucks. It really makes you not want to talk anymore. It makes you rather silence over speaking. I remember I didn't even feel like talking to my family friends at some point. Um, it kind of messes you up when um, you feel that way as an elementary kid. But then I remembered when I was an elementary student, I remember James from James and the Giant Peach. Um, I read the book in third grade. The novel portrays adults as people who are fundamentally absurd. So this is especially true, right? When it comes to James's aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker. Um, they take him, like, they take him in when their parent, when his parents, um, died. So, the woman's bodies are described as being almost too strange to be human. Aunt Sponge is, and I quote, like a great white soggy overboiled cabbage, while Aunt Spiker is only bones and skin. But even the strange old man who appears in the garden one day looks odd to James. James is only seven years old. So it's possible that adult bodies, on, like on the whole, just look strange to him. His perspective as a child means that the things so that may be normal for adults, such as having a body type that deviates from the norm, or in this case of the old man having facial hair with like an odd texture, is so outside of James's experience as to seem absurd. But more broadly, Dahl, the author, suggests that James has the right idea. As a child, James doesn't try to explain away or understand strange things as an adult might. Instead, he literally just accepts them as fact and move on and, and he moves on. That honestly really struck me. Um what I had to say may have been weird or strange in the eyes of other people. I may talk too much, I do talk too much, and um I can be excessively passionate while speaking. But unlike James, the people listening to me didn't accept me the way I was. They chose not to listen. So instead of beating up myself up about it, I realized that I should be the one acting like James. Maybe I should accept their lack of acceptance and figure out how to say what I want to say, but in a way they'd accept because um, delivery is indeed important. I may have only been in elementary But that one book seriously changed my outlook on life. Best part is, um, it's only when reflecting for the sake of these podcasts uh, and for the sake of actually having content, did I realize the significance of the uh, of like the message this specific book portrays. All right, now let's get a tad bit more serious. Multiple studies have discovered. Reading increases social awareness and empathy. It can even reduce prejudice. So not only does it correlate to mental health, but it also affects social issues. A 2013 peer-reviewed study by two academic uh, by two academics discovered that when readers were transported by a book, they became more empathetic. Another study published in the journal Science revealed that reading literary fiction improved the ability to understand the perspectives, beliefs, and views of other people. This is because when we read um, evocative fiction, we experience emotions, mental states, and scenarios constantly and differently. Studies reveal that even though it's not us actually experiencing them, we're able to learn indirectly from them without even having to go through what those characters have go uh, have went through. The idea of acceptance James had can be applied here. 
accepting others for who they are without the need for them to explain themselves is a rare commodity in our society filled to the brim with racial issues. A society with a social construct meant to discriminate the, um, um, those who are deemed different. So what better way to teach a child um, about open-mindedness than through a book? Have that child be aware of what's going on in their society before putting them out there through using breeding and book literature and books and understanding the messages the authors are trying to portray. The authors through their messages are trying to educate. There, many authors have attempted to educate, um, uh, ha have attempted to convey the message of racial pre pre prejudice in a society. Um, the Hate You Give is a very popular and common example. And it also has many other excellent messages and meanings. So rather than putting a child in a situation where they find themselves not knowing what's going on or being or, or finding them finding themselves questioning reality, give them a book. Have them read the book and then have them acknowledge or learn the lessons that book has in order to apply them into their day to day lives. In a study conducted by the reading agency and summarized by the independent, reading for pleasure can increase self-esteem, reduce symptoms of depression, and help build better relationships while also reducing anxiety and stress. So when immersing yourself in a good book, you can be swept away to a world that is separate from yours, thus separating yourself from the dilemmas or stresses you may have. Certain books can also help you realize you are not alone in what you are going through which is often in, oftentimes a focus for the healing process, recognizing others are going through what you are. Now, I would like to draw your attention, if you're still um, actively listening to me, to bibliotherapy, a relatively unknown mental health intervention, um, which is also known as reading therapy. So it mainly refers to structured book reading programs run by clinics, libraries, or schools. And it, its aim is to promote recovery in people with mental health difficulties. So like these are such groups remain uncommon um, despite the efforts of organizations such as the American Library Association, which houses a number of bibliotherapy resources for adults and children. The term bibliotherapy is also used to refer to self-initiated book reading pursued by an individual with mental illness. So this can be supported by um, a doctor, a family member, a peer, a supporter, a therapist, or it can be pursued alone. Several studies have examined whether bibliotherapy can facilitate recovery from, one, from mental illness. One classic study found a decrease in depressive symptoms after eight, like one single program of bibliotherapy. A finding repeated in more, and this finding is repeated in more recent meta-analyses and systematic reviews. Right, so that's, that's um, in regards to bibliotherapy. Now, let's take a quick look at fiction. So interestingly, there are several studies that indicate that reading works of fiction can be of particular benefit to people with or without mental health difficulties. These studies indicate that reading fiction can increase reader empathy, social skills, and interpersonal understanding. No, and that's also known as theory of mind. This research indicates that readers can deeply engage with characters and scenarios, giving them a better understanding of our shared humanity and common struggles. Indeed, leading expert Dr. Keith Oatley of the University of Toronto notes that, and I quote, fiction can augment and help us understand our social experience, end quote. Building on this research, um, personally, I recommend works of fiction to my peers in order to increase their understanding about mental health. So basically, there are two books that I'm going to be recommending to all of you. You have The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne and The Bell Jar by Sylvia Path. And these books, both of them, give readers a deep understanding of the alienation, loneliness, shaming, stigma, and social exclusion that is often experienced by people with mental health difficulties. All right, so um, next up, we have autobiographies and recovery narratives. So a number of courageous people with mental illness have published um, the autobiographical memoirs 
detailing their life experience. Um, these writings often portray both the suffering and distress caused by mental illness, as well as the journey of recovery and, stra- and strategies of resilience. Interestingly, um, uh, this paper, review paper was just released by Dr. Mike Slade and, colli- and his colleagues at the University of Not- Nottingham. Um, and they examined how people with mental illness are affected by reading such as uh, like s- these autobiographies and these recovering narratives. So these results indicate that reading these narratives can increase connectedness and understandings of recovery while validating personal experience and reducing stigma. Some popular autobiographies include The Center It Cannot Hold by Ellen Sachs, um, outlining life with schizophrenia, um, and Matt Haig's Reason to Stay Alive, describing life with depression. These books offer um, hope and inspiration by illuminating the realities of recovery in the face of adversity. Basically, what I'm trying to say is um, that literature and analyzing a book in order to understand its purpose in order to understand the purpose of the characters, it can truly help someone mentally. Um, I've given you, I'm now giving you all some great examples of books. So make like a tree and leaf. Please go read.